Another yeah. one over there. There's one left. In the back. That one, that one the audio oh, has just white noise though. No, no. The, um, Roger, are you done with one of the spigots so we could open it up? Uh, go ahead and uh, yank the blue one. Okay, give Purple me a whole range of XLR there. there. Uh, I'll let you know when I'm done. Okay. I'm literally just going to shoot this press conference. There's that vault number behind it. I don't have to roll on it. It's um, mic level. <laughs> Testing, testing, one, two, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. All good?
small, how are those small tiny ones? You know, uh, Joelle wants to see those tiny ones. I think he has that brain cancer because right. he's always on the phone.
Test, test, one, two, test, test. Like recite a poem. Test, test, one, two. Yeah, yeah, and so, and me, I like to be 
because of my schedule too. Like I, I like to do it like three or four hours or stuff. And so you go in the mornings? No, I go like right in the middle of the day. <laughs> but now the I'm out the Cascade. We actually have we have Kathy and Amy at the whole mountain bike park. Yeah. 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 I just struggle to get out early. I would get out early, but um, I just get out when I can. You know? And my thing too is I need to have pretty high tolerance to heat. I really have to focus. I really don't mind, mind it as long as I have enough water. But the typical you know, I'll go in and like the you know, body is in the this time of year. So usually I do like, you know, I don't really do much more.
side that starts like uh, Wisconsin Guardians. Uh, I forget the name of that one. I don't do, I have, I don't do any group rides, but I do a ride. I do, uh, that was tough. So. I usually go the second group, the first group, all the rest of the guys. I go the flying That's how we go up to the foothill.
Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Everyone's audio good? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Testing, testing. Everyone's good? Raise your hand if you still need more. All good? Great, thanks.
summer and it's still early. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Anybody else need a mic check? Raise your hand. Testing, testing, one, two, three. All good?
Sounds good. No problems hearing us, I assume. Uh, thank you for joining us. I want to quickly run through the program. In a moment, I will introduce our national president and negotiating committee chair, Fran Drescher, and national executive director and chief negotiator, Duncan Crabtree Ireland. Duncan and Fran will have an announcement and remarks, and we'll follow with a Q&A. We will also bring the negotiating committee members up for photo opportunities and we'll conclude about 20 or 30 minutes into Q&A. Um, if you have a question during the Q&A, please raise your hand. I will recognize you, but not a lot of yelling. Let's just be nice and genteel. And um, Duck and a friend will answer as many questions as they can. Again, welcome, and uh, please say good afternoon to sag after National President Fran Drescher, also Chair of the Negotiating Committee, and Duck and Crabtree Island. Good, after, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Duncan Crabtree Ireland, National Executive Director and Chief Negotiator for SAG AFTRA. Yesterday, our union celebrated the 90th anniversary of the incorporation of Screen Actors Guild. During our nearly century long existence, we've fought for and achieved countless gains for working actors. Today, we embark on a new important chapter in our union's history. Earlier this morning, the SAG AFTRA National Board convened following four weeks of negotiations with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, the AMPTP. Because the AMPTP remains unwilling to offer a fair deal on key issues essential to protecting the livelihoods of working actors and performers, SAG-AFTRA's national board unanimously voted to issue a strike order against the studios and streamers. From the time negotiations began on June 7th, SAG-AFTRA staff and the members of our negotiating committee have worked overtime, devoting their evenings, weekends, and holidays to achieving a deal that would ensure a sustainable future for the acting profession. But despite our team's efforts, the MPTP has remained steadfast in its commitment to devaluing the work of our members. Actors deserve a contract that reflects the changes that have taken place in the industry. Unfortunately, the current streaming model has undercut performers' residual income and high inflation has further reduced our members' ability to make ends meet. Additionally, industry expectations around self-tape auditions mean performers are bearing casting costs that were once the responsibility of producers. To complicate matters further, actors now face an existential threat to their livelihoods with the rise of generative AI technology. We've proposed contract changes that address these issues, but the AMPTP has been uninterested in our proposals. Because of this, the board has determined that union members should withhold their labor until a fair contract can be achieved. A strike is an instrument of last resort. We've tried for four weeks to reach a deal with the AMPTP, and unfortunately, they have left us with no alternative. Although we're all disappointed with the AMPTP's reluctance to cooperate, the solidarity among sag after members has never been stronger. Based on the enthusiasm I'm seeing from everyone, I truly believe this union has the unity and the resolve needed to fight for the future of their careers. Due to the broad nature of our membership, this strike does not affect all members of all contract areas, just those working under the 2020 TV theatrical contract. Performers working in interactive entertainment, audiobooks, music, commercials, and other contract areas will not be directly impacted. The strike will begin at midnight tonight, and all of us, union members, leadership, and staff, will be out on the picket lines tomorrow morning. Members are urged to go to sagafterstrike.org 
for answers to common questions as well as information on picket locations. I'd now like to turn the microphone over to sag after President Fran Drescher. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. And thank you, everybody, for coming to this press conference today. It's really important that this negotiation be covered because the eyes of the world, and particularly the eyes of labor, are upon us. What happens here is important because what's happening to us is happening across all fields of labor by means of when employers make Wall Street and greed their priority and they forget about the essential contributors that make the machine run. We have a problem. And we are experiencing that right at this moment. This is a very seminal hour for us. I went in in earnest thinking that we would be able to avert a strike. The gravity of this move is not lost on me or our negotiating committee or our board members who have voted unanimously to proceed with a strike. It's a very serious thing that impacts thousands, if not millions of people all across this country and around the world. Not only members of this union, but people who work in other industries that service the people that work in this industry. And so it came with great sadness that we came to this crossroads, but we had no choice. We are the victims here. We are being victimized by a very greedy entity. I am shocked by the way the people that we have been in business with are treating us. I cannot believe it, quite frankly how far apart we are on so many things, how they plead poverty, that they're losing money left and right when giving hundreds of millions of dollars to their CEOs. It is disgusting. Shame on them. They stand on the wrong side of history at this very moment. We stand in solidarity, in unprecedented unity, our union and our sister unions and the unions around the world are standing by us as well as other labor unions because at some point the jig is up. You cannot keep being dwindled and marginalized and disrespected and dishonored. The entire business model has been changed by streaming, digital, AI. This is a moment of history that is a moment of truth. If we don't stand tall right now, we are all going to be in trouble. We are all going to be in jeopardy of being replaced by machines and big business. Who cares more about Wall Street than you and your family? Most of Americans don't have more than $500 in, a, in an emergency. This is a very big deal, and it weighed heavy on us. But at some point, you have to say, no, we're not going to take this anymore. You people are crazy. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? Privately, they all say, we're the center of the wheel. Everybody else tinkers around our artistry, but actions speak louder than words. And there was nothing there. It was insulting. So we came together in strength and solidarity and unity with the largest strike authorization vote in our union's history. And we made the hard decision that we tell you as we stand before you today, this is major. 
It's really serious. And it's going to impact every single person that is in labor. We are fortunate enough to be in a country right now that happens to be labor friendly. And yet, we were facing opposition that was so labor unfriendly, so tone deaf to what we are saying. You cannot change the business model as much as it has changed and not expect the contract to change too. We're not going to keep doing incremental changes on a contract that no longer honors what is happening right now with this business model that was foisted upon us. What are we doing? Moving around furniture on the Titanic? It's crazy. So the jig is up, AMPTP. We stand tall. You have to wake up and smell the coffee. We are labor and we stand tall and we demand respect and to be honored for our contribution. You share the wealth because you cannot exist without us. Thank you. That's our president. Um, questions? <laughs> uh, right here, Jeremy. So you guys said at the start of talks that you guys were not going to be pulled into any terms that could be negotiated with the DGA. Did the DGA contract become like part of kind of power bargaining when it came to screening and AI and other key another key issue? So first of all, I think it's important for us to know that we respect every union's right to negotiate the contract that's right for their members. And there's nothing about our statements about not wanting to be held to pattern bargaining that in any way are, are intended to detract from the DGA's agreement or any other union's agreement. But sag after members are sag after members, and we went into that negotiation negotiating for our members. And the fact of the matter is that, yes, <clears throat> the AMPTP wants to insist that other unions adhere to things that they've negotiated with, with other unions. And in the case of, for example, minimum increases, that's one example of where that's the case. The companies insisted that we agree to uh, limit the increases in minimum salaries for our members to uh, a pattern deal. And our negotiating committee uh, rejected that idea. Uh, I reject that idea. Our members need to receive increases that allow them to keep up with the pace of inflation we believe that our members should not be working in 2023 for less money in real dollars than they made in 2020. And we certainly believe that our members should not be working at the end of the term of this contract in 2026 for less money than they made in real dollars in 2020. That's wrong, it's unfair, and it's unacceptable. And so uh, we didn't reach any agreement on that point. Duncan. Hang on one second, please. I'd like the committee to come in and join uh, the negotiation. So the, so the AMPTP just sent out a press release basically saying, you guys are reiterating what they said yesterday and what Bob Iger said. You guys have chosen a path that will lead to financial hardship for countless thousands of people who depend on the industry. They're claiming they offered a 76% a increase in high budget SVOD foreign residuals, 58% increase in salaries for major roles. They, they say 11% 11, 11 pay increase in year one, blah, blah, blah. They're, saying, they're claiming all these double digit promises. And they're claiming they had a groundbreaking, I'm quoting them, AI proposal, which protects performers' digital likeness. So what do you say to that? Well, let me, I mean, Fran may have some things she want to say to that, but let me, let me just take one of the items that you mentioned. And I'm not going to be able, not having seen their press release, I can't respond to every point of it. But this groundbreaking AI proposal that they gave us yesterday, and that groundbreaking AI proposal, they proposed that our background performers should be able to be scanned, get paid for one day's pay, and their company should own that scan, their image, their likeness, and should be able to use it 
for the rest of eternity in any project they want with no consent and no compensation. So if you think that's a groundbreaking proposal, I suggest you think again. Uh, Brad? Duncan and Brad, a few weeks ago, uh, you guys put out a video that suggested that you were seeing progress in the, in the talks and you sounded uh, encouraged by what was happening. So what turned? What was the pivot? Where did things go south? Well, you know, initially we started kind of on the outside. They weren't really ready to get to the core issues. And we were encouraged, quite frankly. But we didn't realize that that was where it ended, where it began and ended. And all the core ingredients, you know, we were basically either stonewalled or were so far apart that, the, you know, it was just, and, and in earnest, we gave them an extension of 12 days, which they absolutely wasted, making us feel like we've been duped, like maybe it was just to let studios promote their summer movies another 12 days. They stayed locked behind closed doors. They continued to cancel our meetings with them. We thought, you know, well, maybe they're really getting into it. But then what we ultimately received from them was what my mom would call a lek and a schmeck. <laughs> <laughs> Was this in fact historic? Can you repeat that again? Yeah, the motion picture companies released a statement saying oh. that, uh, that, the, that the union walked away from a historic offer that you guys left the negotiating table. Was this in fact historic? What was historic about it is that we were really so marginalized, so dishonored, and so respect, disrespected that it was really egregious and disgusting. So that's what was historic, that at a moment when um, streaming and AI and digital is so prevalent in the industry, it has disemboweled the industry that we once knew when I do, did the nanny. And everybody was part of the gravy train. Now it's a walled in vacuum. And not only is it unfair to everybody up and down the ladder, but the entity that employs us, it's really un-American and it's unconscionable. What are you doing? <coughs> We're not curing cancer here. It's a collective art form. Right. talk a little bit about how long you expect this to go on. Are we talking about weeks? Are we talking about months? And what would it take to get back to the table? That's up to them. We're open to talking to them tonight. But, uh, you know, it's, it's up to all of this is because of their behavior. It's up to them if they're willing to talk in a normal way that honors what we do. I mean, they are, they are well aware of what it takes to make a deal. Fran and I personally spoke to several of the CEOs of these studios yesterday uh, and at length. They know what it will take to make a deal. They had the power in their hands to make a deal and avoid this strike. They chose not to do that. And last night, we told the ANPTP directly across the table, we're ready, willing, and able to return to the negotiating table whenever they're ready to do so. Their response to us, was that they would be ready to talk whenever uh, we would act in a civilized manner, not be on strike. We told them that it's not uncivilized for people to go on strike. It's a moral right, it's a human right, and it's a legal right of our members to collectively bargain, to organize, and to go on strike if needed to defend their rights, and that we will be happy to approach them and negotiate with them whenever they're ready to do so. We were then later informed that it would probably be a while. So we will be here doing what we need to do to defend our members and to ensure we get a fair contract. And we encourage them to come back to the table um, because we're ready to talk whenever they are. All right, right here, please. It's obvious that AMTP is uh, working in a coordinated effort with all the studios. Are you planning to do the same with uh, 
the other entertainment unions? We've been in constant contact with our sister unions. You know, the, the other unions in this industry have been incredibly supportive. We have been incredibly supportive of them. I'm sure it hasn't gone unnoticed that thousands of sag after members have been walking the WGA picket lines since the beginning of May. But, you know, over the past years, we've been working together closely. The relationships between the industry, entertainment industry unions have never been tighter, have never been closer, and uh, we absolutely um, are standing in solidarity with them, and they are standing in solidarity with us. All right, we're going to go to Abby with people. Use the mics, please. Hi. Um, a lot of us are wondering how this is going to affect uh, promotion of past work, uh, not current movies to be promoted by actors, but things like participating in a panel at 90s Con, or if they are being recognized for their entire body of work. Can you clarify a little bit about the terms? Sure, we uh, will be issuing a strike notice in order to our members today that lay out exactly what members are prohibited from doing as part of the strike and what they can do. We've also communicated directly with members, agents, lawyers, and publicists so that they have this information as well. In general terms, any kind of promotion of any project that was made under the TV theatrical agreements, either current or past, will not be allowed, whether that's at a, a con, at a festival, at a panel, and social media, at a premiere, in any form. Uh, members who have uh, you know, other types of activities going on, like autograph signings, or things that are not related to specific companies or projects that are produced under these agreements, they'll be able to continue doing that. But we encourage all members who have any doubt about the boundaries there to reach out to the union, read the guidance that we'll give them, and we can answer their questions uh, directly and individually. All right, over here. Hey, guys. What do you make of the reports that the AMP, uh, that the Academy's strategy was to bleed union members dry? I know there was a specific regards to the WGA, but what were your thoughts on that, that piece that came out? It was reported in the press that it was reported in the press just recently that there were some executives from the studios who stated that uh, you know that it was okay for writers to go homeless as a result of this strike, or that, like you said, that they want to bleed the people dry. Uh, I mean, I think Fran might have some words to say about that. Evil. A necessary evil. Necessary evil. That's right. Can you believe that? I mean, I mean, we had a whiteboard with quotes just so the room would remember some of the things that were said. But you know what? Eventually. The people break down the gates of Versailles, and then it's over. Well, we're at that moment right now. Thank you. Right here. Hi, Ted Chen, KMBC. Uh, as you know, this is going to have a significant impact on the LA economy, uh, perhaps costing it as much as $30 million a day. What would you want to say to the businesses, to the people who are going to be losing their living because of Hollywood, who are going to be suffering alongside with you? Well, uh, Believe me, our heart bleeds that we had to make this decision. But we can't not get what these members deserve because it's only going to get worse. <clears throat> this is where we drew the line in the sand. And it's a terrible thing to have to do. But we were forced into it. And let's not, let's not forget, actors are working people too, alongside everyone else in this economy. And every working person should feel empowered to stand up for themselves. And when an employer, especially these big multinational corporations, wants to take advantage of you, wants to use their power to squash you under their heel, it is your right and your obligation to stand up to them. And I have a very strong feeling that those other people, whether they're parts of unions yet or not, will see what our members are doing and we'll understand why we had to do it. And Fran and Duncan, I have a quick question, Leslie with the Associated Press. Um, how do you anticipate that this will affect Emmy's campaigning um, amongst actors since nominations were just announced yesterday? The, uh, the, our, our strike rules will not allow any form of promotion for television series, uh, streaming series that have been produced under these contracts. My expectation is that it will bring uh, any actor participation in any campaigning to a close. Hi, um, Charlie Trepani with USA Today. Um, you mentioned uh, some of the issues um, that went into this decision to go on a strike um, involving salary and generated AI. <coughs> Was there one particular overriding issue that proved to be the biggest deal breaker for the union? 
I think there are several really important issues. Uh, Fran and I talked to the CEOs about those issues yesterday, and we mentioned a couple of them. AI, of course, is really important. But in addition to that, the basic respect reflected in minimums that keep you at least so that you're not earning less money today than you were earning years ago, that's another example. And also, as Fran has talked about, the fact that this business model has been changed, but the companies want to just keep our members locked in a contract that, that doesn't reflect that change. We have a proposal regarding the sharing of revenue from streaming services that uh, has been on the table since day one of negotiations. The companies have refused to engage on that proposal and give it any meaningful discussion, much less agree to it. And uh, we discussed that issue with the CEOs yesterday as well. Okay, right here, please. Don't come in. The name of the Spanish that was uh, broadcast is that we are here at this press conference. I would like to ask you in Spanish, ¿qué provocó el rompimiento de estas negociaciones y de qué manera han sido tratados por los representantes de los productores y los estudios cinematográficos? Pues pienso que, pienso que el problema en estas negociaciones es la realidad que los representantes de los productores no tienen respeto uh, por los actores y actrices uh, que están trabajando bajo sus contratos y quienes trabajo es lo que hace posible uh, esta industria. Y todos de nuestros miembros, los miembros de habla inglesa y de habla hispana, son completamente unidos en uh, luchar por sus derechos contra estos empleadores y uh, todos nosotros vamos a, a hacer lo que es necesario a asegurar que nuestros miembros de habla hispana y de habla inglesa que están trabajando bajo estos contratos tienen contratos con respeto y con salarios justos y términos uh, apropiados. También la niñera says no más. <laughs> as, uh, I want to step back, uh, as existential. And that makes the stakes very high. And of course, the companies claim it's existential for them in terms of the challenges that the business is facing economically and, and theatrical and linear television, the amount of money that needed to spend to compete with Netflix in streaming. How do you, how do you win a victory uh, in a situation where there is just so much head to head so much fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and so much at stake. I just say that I have zero doubt that these companies could have agreed to every single item in our proposal package without a problem whatsoever in their bottom line. They could do that. They choose not to do that. Uh, we told them, we told the CEOs yesterday, and we've told the AMPTP across the table as it relates to our streaming revenue share proposal, that we would be flexible on the terms of that. The issue is, that there has to be a change in the structure. It's like what Fran said, we can't continue working off of a contract that was designed for a different business model. Despite that indication of flexibility, unwillingness to move in our direction or even substantively discuss the proposals. There is no, this strike could have been avoided 100% by these companies simply being reasonable and nothing about this contract would damage those companies at all. This is a matter of respect for sag after members, for the work they contribute, and it just, uh, it just isn't there. Fran, do you want to add to that? Uh, do I? Do well, you want to add to that? <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I mean, I said to their faces that, you know, you're sitting there trying to squeeze us out of our livelihoods. You're systematically figuring out ways to carve us out of what is due us. And you're sitting on the wrong side of history. Shame on you. That's what I said. Thank you. All right, right here, please. Uh, Alison Petrowski, Channel 9 Australia. Fran, you mentioned that the eyes of the world are watching at the moment. What is your message to actors and other members of the entertainment industry operating uh, in different parts of the world, uh, but operating in different parts of the world, but fighting the same battles that you are here? Well, I, you know, we all have to stand together on this because it's like a malignancy that's spreading, and we're already in stage four. And if it doesn't get attended to immediately and swiftly with precision, it's going to destroy not only each of us, but the industry at large. 
I'll just add, you know, SAG-AFTRA has members all around the world, and we also have extremely close relationships with our sibling actor unions all around the world as well. And there have been plenty of times in the past when SAG-AFTRA members have gone to bat to fight for our fellow members around the world, whether it be in New Zealand uh, with respect to the Hobbit situation, whether it be in South Africa, helping our colleagues there achieve copyright protections in their domestic law that they didn't have before. We've stood by and we do stand by them and we know that they stand by us, we've spoken to them, and we know that we have solidarity from actors all around the world because they know this is a just <coughs> fight, this is the same fight that they have. We're all in it together and we are gonna win it. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, another first time question? Hi, I'm Brooks from the New York Times. Um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, optics of CEOs at Can and Sun Valley while holding the line, uh, you know, we can't if they can't afford uh, to, to keep your proposals. The companies push back by sending a photo of you in Italy and, and you know, the selfie with Kim Kardashian. That wasn't a selfie. Uh, excuse me, I just want to set the record straight Fran, on that. Before you do, can oh. I just say something? Before Fran answers that, uh, before Fran answers that, I want to say it is outrageous that they would do that. You know what Fran was doing was Fran was working, which is what our members do. And for these employers to cynically try to turn our members against Fran because she's doing a job that she was under contract to do, while by the way, she was zooming into our negotiations after work hours, working 18 hours or more a day, it is outrageous, it is wrong, it's despicable, and they should be ashamed of it, but I'm sorry, Fran, if you want to say that. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I mean, uh, you know, I'm a brand ambassador for a fashion company, and so is Kim. I had only met Kim seconds before that publicity picture was taken. It had nothing to do with being at a party or having fun. It was absolute work. I was in hair and makeup three hours a day, walking in heels on cobblestones, doing things like that, which is work, not fun. I'm sure Kim would have rather have been at her home in Malibu with her children too, but we work. That's what we do. And at 10.30 at night, I would leave the event, I would go to my hotel room, and I'd call into the Zoom. And when I couldn't get through to them because I was on a plane, I was texting with them constantly throughout the plane ride. I worked around the clock in three different time zones because my parents live in Florida, though I keep asking them to move here. <laughs> <laughs> and I manage their well-being as well. So, you know, I think that all of the people standing behind me stand behind me. of streaming subscription revenue, and that streaming subscription revenue would be divided up um, by project based on the project's contribution to the success of that streaming service. Now, as I'm sure many of you who follow the industry know, the streamers are famous for not sharing information, being non-transparent, and since we knew that they wouldn't want to share any kind of viewership success data, we went and found another source for that data from a particular company in the industry, an analytics company. And then instead of engaging with the proposal, discussing it with us, making any counter proposal, trying to figure out if there was a way to get to agreement, what they did is launch a, uh, you know, a, uh, an attack on that company, trying to claim that that company doesn't have you know, good quality or whatever else. Again, not legitimate at all. This was their distraction tactic to try to avoid engaging on a totally legitimate proposal. And from day one to day 35 of these negotiations, we never got any substantive response to that proposal, um, and it's just part of the larger story of the companies refusing to engage with legitimate proposals and refusing to do what it takes to try and make a deal, and, and that's the reality. Thank you. Right here? Uh, hello. 
Alex Golden of NHK Japan Broadcasting. Uh, if I have it right, this is the first uh, SAC after strike in decades since the 1960 or 1986, if you count the 14 hours. Uh, I would, my question is, do you remember what the issues in those previous strikes were? And do they relate to today at all? So first of all, let me just say, this is the first SAG after strike in this contract uh, in over 40 years. Um, it is true we have had other strikes since that time in other contracts, but you know this is not a strike happy union. This is a union that views strikes as a last resort, but we're not afraid to do them when that's what it takes to make sure our members receive a fair contract. You know, our strike in 1960 is the reason that our members have a health plan. It's the reason that our members have a pension plan and it's the reason why our members get residuals. Uh, you know, and, and successive strikes since then have been the way that we have achieved key proposals that have been necessary to keep our members uh, you know, having a professional life, having a career, and having the ability to do this job. I'm not an actor, but I know, because I spend all my time around actors, it is a hard job. Anyone who doesn't know that, it is a job that requires you to have incredible resilience, that requires you to spend most of your time looking for work as opposed to doing work. It is a job that it makes it hard to get basics in life, like health insurance, like a, any kind of retirement. That's what this union provides, and I highly doubt there are any members of this union today who would say it wasn't worth it to go on strike in 1960 for as long as it took to achieve our health plan and our residuals. Well, this is the same kind of strike. This is the kind of strike that makes sure that our members livelihoods are not taken away by artificial intelligence. This is the kind of strike that makes sure as this industry changes its business model, our members are not left behind. This is the kind of strike that says our members are not gonna take less money six years later because of inflation that the companies refuse to account for and a host of other things. And it's the kind of strike that is unfortunate, it's sad that we're at this point, but it's 100% necessary and it's 100% deserved by the actions of these companies. Here, here. Okay, last question right here. Hi, so let's finish it up with what is your message to the fans and consumers who aren't interested in the nuance that we're discussing here today? They just want their favorite TV shows or they want to go to the movies. Well, what makes you think they're not interested in what's happening here? I think that they have an allegiance to all of us because they, we bring joy to their lives, we bring entertainment to their lives, and during COVID, they turn to us for everything. So I don't think that your assumption that they don't really care about anything but being entertained over the summer is the bottom line when the people that give so much to them and enrich their lives in so many ways are saying, we are being taken advantage of in a terrible way. And if we let this happen to us, dollars for donuts, it's gonna happen to you and your family, your children, and everybody that you work with too. That's how threatening this moment is in our nation's history. Photographers. 
Can we get a shot too, please? Thank you. 